And um, I work on uh, marine biogeography and I look at the um, impact of climate change on the uh, uh, spatial uh, distribution of marine biodiversity um, from global to regional. And today I'm gonna talk about the shifts that we are seeing under climate change. Um, and um, so I'm gonna take you through the um, um, how we calculate the species diversity and at different spatial scales and how we extract data and process that. And, um, and then look at the spatial distribution um, across latitude, longitude, and also depth uh, sometimes. Um, and um, if we have enough data and, um, and then look at the, uh, how the, this distribution has been shifting under climate change in the past, present, and um, also under future climatic scenarios. Um, so uh, these are the key concepts. So if we can see that there are, is a site A, which we can say is a local region, and and these different symbols represents uh, different types of species. And if we uh, just look at inside of this site A, um, and just calculate simply um, the number of species, then um, it's um, um, it's alpha. Uh, it we designate as alpha diversity. And then um, when we compare it, um, the site A with site B, and look how the composition of species is changing or the number is changing, we we call it as beta diversity. So it, it depends on like if we find a completely new set of species, um, uh, it's species, um, it's 100% turnover, or if it is just uh, the difference is just because of the number of species that then we can say, okay, site A is nested within site B. And um, and then when we look at the overall region, which includes both the sites, um, uh, we designate that as uh, gamma diversity, which is uh, basically the uh, we can say the species richness of overall uh, bigger region. Um, and um, so I work on uh, global um, uh, data sets. And uh, so this is how uh, we look at uh, the whole earth. We divide, divide this whole earth into different grids and that can be um, like a bigger grids and then smaller grids and um, which could uh, be actually like latitudinal bands like this. Um, and then and then at a, a smaller scale, we look at the regions which could be divided into different hexagon size or square shaped grids. Um, and they are of these uh, these sizes can vary between like five fifty thousand square kilometer hexagons or or eight hundred thousand or even smaller. Um, yeah, and then we um, uh, look at the uh, spatial gradient, like how these alpha diversity, gamma diversity, which is at, at the bigger um, spatial scale, and then within that um, are, is changing in uh, using different um, uh, diversity indices. So these are the global databases that I use. Um, it's um, basically Ocean Biodiversity Information System and GBIF. Um, that's where we get the data on the uh, occurrence uh, of the species records. And then after we have these data, uh, we compare the name of the species with uh, from the World Register of, of Marine Species to see if uh, the names are valid and if there are any errors and if they, um, if they are accepted or not. And um, just to have this data quality control. And then um, for environmental uh, data sets, uh, we get the data from GIPCO or Hidley's and by Oracle. So in this example, um, um, we collected data uh, from uh, OBIS and uh, which was like 23.7 million distribution records and then cross check, cross match the species name in worms and um, and just use the data for uh, over uh, almost like 50,000 element species. Um, and then after quality control, we had only 12.6 million records that we looked at and, and then classified these as pelagic and benthic based on the species um, um, information. If they have uh, one life stage as benthic, we define them as benthic. And if they are overall pelagic, then they were pelagic. And that's the number of species that we looked at. Um, and then we use these uh, occurrence records to um, plot against um, the latitude and the, the um, we use Chow index to minimize sampling bias by uh, in the number of samples. And uh, in this graph, you can see that um, 
um, because we wanted to see uh, how the distribution of uh, species richness is changing um, um, across uh, as we go from the north to the south. And if uh, if it is aligned with the hypothesis saying that we have more number of species at the tropics, so uh, that was very interesting to test uh, uh, when we have this much of data. Um, and then in these uh, many graphs, you can see that uh, they, uh, the, the x-axis is uh, latitude and the y-axis is the, basically the estimated number of species using Chow index. Um, and we can see that um, uh, on the on the left hand side of the graph is the southern south uh, southern hemisphere, and in in the middle is the equator, the zero, and on the uh, right hand side is the um, is the northern hemisphere. So, well, it didn't go by the hypothesis. What we ex we would have expected that there would be more number of species at the equator, but uh, there is a dip actually at the equator, and this. This this equatorial dip was quite common among in all well it was there in all the species when we looked at all the species data but when uh, we defined this pelagic and benthic it was also very consistent and then there was the the peaks in the the, the diversity was actually at the at the subtropics not at the tropics not at the equator. Um, so, um, and then uh, we also model this uh, species richness against um, uh, sea surface temperature um, and, and found that um, on, if, we, if the temperature goes above 20 degrees, basically the species richness kind of declines there, um, except few of which are very tropical species like demersal and reef associated fishes, but they also kind of reaching to this asymptote. Um, and uh, that's that's this temperature where we have the maximum that's at the equator where we have the maximum temperature you know this red thing shows the maximum temperature and that's where all these species richness is elevating and that's where we are finding uh, this equatorial dip so and then the next step was to um, see how the uh, uh, the sea surface temperature has been changing uh, in the different parts of the world so we divided uh, this um, into Arctic North temperate tr tropics, and this is basically um, uh, the x-axis shows the uh, time time period uh, from 1920 onwards until 2015, and then the y-axis is the SST sea surface temperature anomaly, and we can see that there has been um, uh, consistent rise in uh, temperature um, in the in the northern hemisphere as compared to the southern hemisphere. So to see how the, the latitudinal distribution in species richness has changed over time, we could only do it for three different time periods um, uh, of 20 years, uh, from 1955 to 1974, then 1975 to 1994, and 1995 to 2015. And because uh, because how much data we had, you know, so we had to uh, make a balance between that we um, we have enough data to derive significant conclusions. So um, so from nineteen, um, so we can see in uh, here uh, in these graphs uh, for all species that. Um, Basically, the green one shows the the 1955 to 1974. The distribution is very much unimodal, and but then in the latest time period, it is going. Um, um, this, this we find this dip at the equator, and then the diversity is kind of like has shifted uh, in in the subtropics, the peaks, and this is very much prominent in the pelagic species, but also in the benthic species too this kind of shift in the northern hemisphere, as we can see here. Um, when it comes to species turnover, we also did the same thing to uh, model the uh, species turnover against latitude. And interestingly, we found that uh, the, there is uh, the species turn. So in, in the graph on the right hand side, you can see latitude and then species turnover, which is very much unimodal. And species richness uh, on the left side, uh, the axis, uh, is uh, is species richness, which is actually bimodal. So 
So it was very contrasting to see that the, we find high species turnover at the equator. And this is because we have more endemicity uh, in the in the tropics, you know, and there are more uh, uh, geographic barriers, and uh, you find more number of biogeographic realms there as well. But uh, with the increasing temperature, this would indicate that there is more habitat in, uh, uh, fragmentation that is happening. So we we are losing not just we are not just losing species, but also this kind of uh, peak indicates the just to fragmentation of uh, of a species diversity, basically. Um, so the next step was to um, look more closely into um, uh, this a subset of species, uh, which uh, represents uh, some ecosystem, and uh, we chose coral reef ecosystem to look for it. Um, and this is uh, basically why, because coral reefs are very important, as we all know, and they are also very sensitive indicators of climate change. Now, the next step was to um, because uh, until now we looked at the observed data and how this has changed over time and, and uh, but how this will change uh, in the future uh, we wanted to uh, do some more uh, future modeling and uh, this is basically uh, interesting the model uh, like when you you do predictions we can we can match uh, we match the species occurrence with the environmental data where they occur and then uh, predict where the the species are gonna uh, be uh, occurring in the uh, in in the new environmental set so uh, this kind of habitat modeling is important because it completes the spatial gap in point data distribution as uh, because this was the problem that we were finding in the uh, in the previous research, but it was more important to do that because we were looking at the observed data as how it was, and if it shows something uh, important uh, related to climate change impacts. Um, and and now we are moving to uh, this uh, predicted habitat suitability uh, models um, under different scenarios. And uh, for the coral uh, reefs, uh, uh, this research uh, we use the um, uh, the fifty seven species of coral uh, corals and uh, their inhabitants, which included fish, mollusks, uh, arthropods, and polychaetes. And uh, these uh, are basically um, um, uh, occurring in the warm water, which is represented by the yellow color data points, and also in the cold water. So these are different sets of species representing cold and warm water coral reef ecosystem. Um, and we uh, use Maxin modeling, um, sorry, we use these uh, uh, environmental data from um, by Oracle and this, uh, uh, in this temperature, uh, sorry, the environmental layers were sea bottom temperature, salinity, current velocity, and we predicted the species distribution in the present. Um, situation and in the in the future scenarios under RCP 4.5 and 8.5, and also used uh, geographical layer depth to to see how how uh, it varies with depth. Um, so um, so uh, we use Maxent uh, modeling uh, to uh, to to predict the species distribution. Um, so that's what I previously mentioned that the species occurrence data was. Uh, matched with the environmental layers, and then the models were calibrated using different parameters in there. And then uh, we had this final models and then global predictions. And then these global projections were then compared. Um, the future ones uh, were compared with the present ones. And then we got the uh, the estimate of like how um, uh, the uh, the difference between the present and the future suggested if the species has lost it, its occurrence in the future or has gained a new occurrence uh, in somewhere else uh, in, in, in the future uh, scenarios. Um, so these were the results. And basically, we modeled uh, for each species these different uh, under different scenarios and then overlaid all the models, um, all the differences that we, uh, we, we found uh, in, in the distribution of species. And then we overlaid all these models together 
to see if there are regions where we find a collective loss of the species or gain of the species. And here in this slide, um, you see the collective loss of the species uh, in different parts of the world. So we did the global projections, but it shows um, these data are actually um, five arc minute. Uh, this is the resolution, five arc minute. So they are very precise, like much more smaller grids than what I showed you in the previous time. Um, so uh, we can see that uh, almost uh, all the warm water species have lost their distribution in, in this uh, RCP 4.5 scenario in 2050. And this, this color graph actually shows the number of species that are, have, have been losing their distribution. And uh, and in our uh, in eight point five scenario, this uh, this is even more intense, uh, especially in in Southeast Asia. And uh, here, uh, this is um, the uh, in twenty one hundred, and you can see that almost more than ninety nine percent of the coral reefs. Um, and and their associated species, they have lost their distribution. Um, it was really heartbreaking to see these results for me. Um, and interestingly, the um, the species in the cold water they actually uh, gained a lot of their distribution in the in the Arctic Ocean. But there is no real um, uh, gain for the tropical ones here, as we can see. There is no gain uh, in in these parts. Um, we further calculated the um, uh, the area that was lost uh, or or gained uh, in e each of these different groups, and we can see, of course, um, on 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 the in the graphs you can see on the left uh, y axis is the area, and on the x axis is the groups. So. And and this orange, dark orange color represents the worst case scenario in uh, RCP 8.5 in 2100, where we have the maximum loss. And uh, yeah, and then if you compare to the gain, and this is for warm water species, um, the gain is much, much less than uh, than the, the loss, basically. Except uh, for fish, uh, well, it's also less, but uh, fish... Uh, uh, we can say they are more mobile and they could uh, cover more distance. So, so it's kind of they they still can gain a little bit more than other other groups. Um, and this is the result for cold water species. Um, so the loss uh, and uh, is is a lot, but also there is we can see there is gain. And when we go more into the details of which species um, is gaining or losing more. Um, uh, than loss or gaining more than, uh, you know. So we can see for the warm water species, of course, all of them are losing more than they gain in the future. Um, whereas the um, cold water species, this is quite mixed. So, uh, and when we look closely into which species are actually losing more, these are actually those species which are occurring much higher up in the north, especially in the, uh, they are more Arctic specific species. But um, the ones which are gaining more, like the polychaetes, they are actually the species which has a wider distribution and they are more generalist. So we can derive a conclusion that all the species which has less uh, or restricted um, a geographical range and they occur in a very specific environmental conditions. Um, they, they are at high risk here uh, as compared to the ones which has wider uh, geographic range and much wider environmental uh, range as well. Um, so uh, we might see a more generalist species appearing um, as, as we can see from these results. Um, so we don't know how uh, this uh, this kind of turnover in the species, uh, especially in the north, is going to affect whether it's uh, uh, if it is a positive change that we're going to see in the ecosystem or a negative change. But definitely um, there will be some kind of change that we can expect in the ecosystem functioning 
um, in in both the warm and the cold waters. Um, these results basically are uh, well. We, these these data are mostly coastal and shallow water. So uh, definitely, we need more data. Um, uh, well, from the the from from the study from the PNAS one was mostly uh, shallow water data. So definitely, we need more data from the deep sea to see how it is uh, working. And um, uh, yeah, the results. Uh, uh, we have found are quite striking and um, these models can be improved more by including more uh, species uh, physiological information, their life cycle information, um, and integrating that into these, these kind of prediction modelings. Nevertheless, these models are, uh, I, I believe, are quite good to give us the uh, overview of how the future may look like. And uh, and I believe the, uh, a lot can be done to uh, by integrating these models in the strategic implementation of the um, resource management. And uh, yeah, so that's it from my side. And I would like to thank all my co-authors, my friends and uh, people who have been so supportive in, in these research. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I'm open for the questions. Chaya, thank you so much for uh for your